Chance of Sonar was one of my favorite games of 2023, which is really saying something. Starting as a hobby project from two French artists, Julien Moyer and Thomas Van Wel, Chance of Sonar is all about deciphering foreign languages and cultures. Filled with varied and satisfying gameplay, it's an engaging ride all the way through, engaging enough to make a certain green freaky bird jealous. It'll leave you feeling like a linguistic genius capable of learning any language just off of pure intuition and logic, a feeling so intoxicating it might compel you to buy a ticket to Paris, just to be thoroughly disappointed. And not because it took you a whole trip into a foreign place to humble yourself, nor because of the condition of the actual city, but because it turns out that everyone there already speaks English. Seriously, speaking English is a privilege we take for granted. We're free to learn whatever extra language while the rest of the world is burdened to learn this god-awful language. Oh, I could go off on how useless the words bi-weekly and bi-monthly are. And if we all speak the same language like English, God might confuse us like in the tale that inspires the game, the Tower of Babel. Unified by one language, mankind once built a massive tower on the lands of Shinar. With ambitions high enough to breach the heavens, nothing felt impossible for man. And so, God confused the people and their language, causing them to abandon the tower and spread across the world post-flood. The lore for the game goes a little differently, and it's all, ironically, shown rather than told. The game really clicked with me since I already enjoy deciphering and guessing other languages. Especially when I'm able to leverage that knowledge back into English. I even found a more meta way of playing the game by switching languages in the options, or opzioni. Although it's not a great way of learning a language. It's more helpful for reinforcing a language like the Spanish you took in high school. And occasionally there are some very specific words that I don't even use in English. Unlike real words and languages, there is an intuition in learning the symbols of the game. All of the verbs have a line underneath them, all of the people include a symbol for man, and all of the places are enclosed by a box. Of course, you also have to learn their grammar as well. For example, this is a symbol for man, and to indicate plurality, you need to add a duplicate to make the word men. Pretty different from English where you just add an S, or an ES if it already ends with an S. But then that doesn't apply to the example I just used where instead of man's it's men- Do you see how hard English is? Luckily it won't be as hard to learn the language of the devotees as- Hold on, who are these guys? Oh, they speak a different language. Yes, in Chance of Sonar you learn not only one fictional language, but multiple, each with their own words, rules, groups, and cultures. And much like its gorgeous aesthetics, it's all minimalistic. Which is fine for the scope of the game, all of these elements are in service of contextualizing the puzzles. Some hints are found through observing the culture of each group. Comparing the words of the devotees to the warriors, both have their own vocabularies that reflect the cultures. The devotees are religious and have words like god, preacher, and church. The warriors don't have such words and instead have more militant ones like duty, weapon, and fortress. With such a fundamental and conceptual disconnect, it's a fertile breeding ground for miscommunication. To overcome this disconnect, you'll have to approximate the words that the cultures lack. For example, almost all of the cultures lack the word for we, so you have to instead pluralize the word for I. This reminds me of real words that are unique to cultures, or words that do not have a direct translation. I might have misremembered this, but I had a Swedish friend once tell me the word mula, which means to stuff one's face with snow. He wanted to show off how this specific action had its own word, with possibly 94 other variations. It might reflect the uh, playful nature of Swedish culture. Meanwhile, other cultures might not have a word for snow. For Korean culture, a unique word I know is ulkanada, which is a very beautiful word that reflects how beautiful Korean culture is. It would make for a great tattoo. It's used to describe something that is healing and uh, spicy. It's very niche, and mostly applies to drinking spicy soup and uh, clearing the sinus. So when you drink some good sundubu jjigae after a night of soju, you'll say... But real languages are complex enough to where it doesn't prevent you from understanding these words and concepts. The language barrier might actually be lesser than the cultural barrier. Like Koreans using the English word fighting. You got this, fighting girl! Fighting! You know what fighting means, but why? Well, fighting or piting resembles the word fighting, which means you can do it. It's a word of encouragement, usually in the context of spectating a sport or wishing someone good luck on a test. 
It's similar to saying let's go in English or forza in Italian. Actually, the Japanese also use the word faito in a similar fashion. The same words or concepts can have different connotations based on context and culture, and the game reflects that. According to the warriors, the hedonistic bards are called the chosen ones, whereas the devotees are called... Oh. And it doesn't help when you have to use that word to describe an actual monster. It's not much better than how the bards see the warriors that admire them, which is also the word for what they essentially call their slaves. Such a limited vocabulary would shape what you believe in and how you behave, which is exactly what the Sapir-Horf hypothesis suggests, that language affects the way you think. Though that term is a misnomer and the subject itself has been highly contentious. But there has been some recent empirical evidence that suggests the effect might exist in a weaker degree, as linguistic relativity instead. A quick test, can you tell me which cardinal direction are you facing right now? You know, are you facing east, south, southwest? Without a compass, do you know which direction is north? Well, the Kuktaya people of Australia do, instantly. Because of their language and culture, they're always conscious of where they are relative to the cardinal directions. In fact, that is how they greet each other. They start off conversations by stating which direction they're heading. And it's not just a neat party trick, they're better navigators because of this. Although, is this because of their language or more so their culture? English has words for cardinal directions. We understand the concept, we just don't have a culture that emphasizes them in this way. Uh, for the scope of this video, let's just say it's both. Regardless of how much language influenced thoughts, it didn't help overcome the cultural gap amongst the groups of the tower. The Anchorites, with their technical prowess, first built the tower and opened it up to all the other groups. But as the tower grew in popularity, so did miscommunication and misunderstanding. Attempts were made to cross the language barrier, but it was not enough to cross the cultural barrier. Eventually, each group found their reasons to section themselves off. The warriors became insular, blocking off the devotees over prejudice. The bards became indolent, uninterested in any culture but their own. The alchemists became zealous, doing anything for the sake of progress. And finally, the anchorites became exiled, trapped by their advanced technology. The tower became a partition of segregated cultures, until the protagonist was created to step in as this multilingual and multicultural messiah. Learning the words and the ways of all the people and showing how each of them can provide what the others lack. Whether it be strength, music, science, freedom, or kinship. While ascending the tower, we observe how each culture is more technologically advanced than the previous culminating into this dystopian, lifeless world. Technological superiority can't fix everything, not even death. It'll come to a point where it anchors people, leaving them as isolated husks, unable to communicate with others even of the same language. Yes, of course we need science and technology, otherwise we wouldn't believe that germs exist and lack ways to cure diseases. But we also need faith, something to believe in. Otherwise, we break down and become useless nihilists that believe that nothing matters. We can place our faith in each other and trust that they can provide what we lack. A machine can translate words, but it can't translate culture. At least not yet. We still need people to learn and explain other cultures. And this can't be done by having everyone learn the same language. So much would be lost in the process. If language and culture can affect the way we think, then we can gain different modes of thought by learning multiple. Just another perspective is all that is needed to reveal what's necessary. While differing views can cause strife, they can also solve problems. This is reflected by the very end of the game, where it shows that the symbol that each culture holds paramount is actually the same thing under different perspectives. Literally. I guess this moment of clarity was so potent it unbabbled all the people in the end. Anyways, it revealed that the one thing that unites all cultures is a purpose. Something to place our faith and science in. All achieved through language and culture. If all of that is too lofty, then this is the key takeaway. Play Chance of Sonar and learn another language. Before you go, just I just want to say thank you. You know, really like... Thank you for watching this video all the way through. It's already a miracle enough for you to, well, I guess, be on YouTube in the first place. And then it's another miracle for this video to show up on your feed and then for you to watch it and then watch it all the way through. So like, 
you know, I just really want to take the time to just thank you for all of that. You know, I hope you found this video entertaining and find it interesting enough to, you know, think about. And um, I also really want to thank those that subscribe to me as well, that you liked my videos and you find my stuff interesting enough to do that. So really, thank you guys so much for that. And I'll be sure to make more videos. Um, you might be surprised by what the next video is. It is related to language, but, you know, it's not related to video games. So I guess look out for that. You don't even got to watch that video. You know, I already thank you enough for just watching this one. So thank you.